In today's video, we're going to be answering questions about radiation from our comment section. We've done other videos on these different topics, but we wanted to answer your question specifically. So we're going to be talking about, can you re-radiate the prostate? You know, things like if I need a TERP, do I get it before or after? Beam radiation is so much travel. Like, is there something that I can do that'll take less time, but still be effective? So today I'm interviewing Dr. Mark Schultz, who's a full-time medical oncologist who focuses solely in prostate cancer, and he's going to be answering your questions. So in this video, we're answering questions from our comment section. We've been releasing a couple of videos in the past about radiation, but recently we also released a couple more. And there were just a lot of questions based off that video, and so we thought we would sit down today and answer them. So the first question was regarding travel, because IMRT is typically done um, a lot of times beam radiation with 48 rounds, and it's a lot of travel for a patient who's typically older and they're kind of concerned about work and they're wondering if they have localized prostate cancer, do they have to get IMRT or are there other forms of radiation that would give them the ability not to have to take off of work and take off that much time? Yeah, it becomes an issue. Uh, here in Los Angeles, uh, traveling five miles can take 45 minutes. There are a lot of nice answers to that because there are forms of beam radiation like SBRT and CyberKnife, which can be condensed into a day or a week. And then there are the brachytherapy options, seed implant radiation, which can be given in a single day or two treatments a week, uh, a week apart. The issue, of course, is whether these methodologies are as effective and uh, whether they incur more toxicity. And the answer, of course, is partly dependent on the skill of the people that are giving the treatment and always an essential component in the world of prostate cancer. But assuming equally uh, effective and skillful treatment administration, these shorter modalities do not incur greater side effects. The only caveat to that is that uh, the way our bodies react to slower radiation versus faster radiation is partly dependent on how our immune systems process and heal uh, the, the, the radiated tissue afterwards. Some patients have a biology that adapts better to slow radiation, others adapt better to fast radiation. And technology has been developed now, a company called Miradex is offering uh, assays that can look at your particular genetic makeup and determine if you're predisposed to greater side effects with quick radiation versus slow radiation. Before I get to my next question, this September we are having an in-person Prostate Cancer Patients and Caregivers Conference. It's a great way to get your questions answered and to be part of the prostate cancer community. So you can learn more at PCRI.org. Now, please click that subscribe button. When you do this, it tells YouTube that this video was helpful for you and they'll push our videos out to other people who have questions about prostate cancer. And if you would like to donate and join our cause, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. Now back to my conversation with Dr. Scholz on radiation. This patient had a localized Gleason 7, and it was 4 plus 3, and their PSA was around 8. The, they met with radiation oncologists, they met with a lot of different people, and they decided to do brachytherapy, and then they did 25 rounds of beam radiation as well. Now, his PSA after three months is only at 3.3, and he's very concerned that after three months with that much radiation, that he's not really, the problem's not really handled, you know, and he's saying, you know, yeah, it dropped five points, but is it really being effective, and how do I know? Well, that's a really important question because this uh, PSA reaction to radiation is often misunderstood. You go to a facility and they aim this invisible, powerful radiation beam at your prostate, and you'd think it would just blow it out of the water. Uh, but uh, what happens is the radiation simply poisons the DNA of the cancer cells. It doesn't burn the prostate or the, uh, or the cancer out of the water. And that poisoning process only goes into effect when the cancer decides to try and replicate, to have babies and proliferate. So if prostate cancer, which often can grow very slowly, doesn't replicate for three to six months after the radiation is administered, it continues to survive. So the typical pattern of PSA decline after radiation is sort of a slow, gentle, downward floating process that can go out to a year or two easily. My uh, counsel to patients that are monitoring their PSA, which they should do every three months after the radiation, is to be satisfied with any decline as long as it's in a downward slope, you're on your way. It's when you have a 
PSA rise, not just one, because you can get PSAs that jump around, but a pattern of rise that you need to be concerned that maybe there's a new problem that needs to be uh, diagnosed and dealt with. So we have a patient who has a localized tumor in his prostate, and he's trying to decide which treatment he wants. His urologist is telling him that he has to have surgery first over radiation because he can't get surgery after radiation if that is the case. So is this still true in today's modern times? Uh, I think the power of that argument from the urologist used to be true. And I think that in 2024, with the modern technology that the radiation therapist can deliver, it's no longer true. The essence of concern is for what to do if the radiation doesn't sterilize the tumor in the prostate. You have a problem. And this is a problem that was pretty common if you go back 15 years because the radiation therapy wasn't as focused and powerful as it is today. Honestly, I think the surgeons are running out of arguments to do surgery. Surgery is connected with a lot of negative things, incontinence, wearing diapers, and greater incidence of impotence, uh, and just going through an operation rather than having an invisible beam aimed at your prostate. So using a treatment with the idea that it's going to fail and that you need a backup uh, sounds plausible, but it's actually a bad plan. You really want to initiate a treatment that will get the job done the first time. In my view, in this modern era, it's state-of-the-art radiation, not state-of-the-art surgery. So my next question was on Prostox. So people are wondering, how is it administered? Do they need to have a doctor, you know, give them a script to go get it? Can they just call a company? And what is the process of getting the test? Yeah, I'm not intimately aware with the whole mechanism, but my understanding is that you can just contact the company uh, directly, uh, Miradex, M-I-R-A-D-X, and they will walk you through the process. I think a doctor has to order it, but they may have their own proprietary doctors, or maybe they can work with your physician to order it. The actual test itself can be a mouth swab, or it can be a blood test. So this is a question we get often, is can you re-radiate the prostate? That is the issue. We addressed this surgery versus radiation sequence versus the converse. And, and I argued that you don't want to be thinking in those terms. But what about that extremely rare case? Or maybe someone went for a radiation treatment at a suboptimal center that doesn't do the job right. The good news is that the salvage options for people to treat a tumor that's in a previously radiated prostate, the list is long. The options are many. Uh, one of them is further radiation, and that has been found to be a feasible proposition. There are other options as well, cryotherapy, laser treatments, high-intensity focused ultrasound, Tulsa Pro, electroporation. The issue, of course, is that retreating a previously treated area is more tricky, and you certainly want to be dealing with the most top-flight talent that you can find. And uh, identifying who that is is always a challenge. A lot of this goes on behind closed doors, and you may not see the outcomes for some time. But it's a struggle we have with finding talent in any field of endeavor in life. Word of mouth, online reviews, these sorts of things uh, we have to rely on. And if people prioritize that as the number one issue, finding the talent, that's probably more important than whether it's a radiation salvage or a cryo salvage. Oftentimes I see in the comment section, how would you define a center of excellence based off of a specific treatment? And so they kind of want to know what research they can do, what questions they can ask to make sure that they're really getting quality treatment. Well, it starts with asking questions. It's hard work, it's ambiguous and intimidating. And I think a lot of times that people don't want to engage with those sorts of challenging problems. And I understand that. Let's just hope this guy knows what he's doing. And we've got a problem, let's get, get to it, let's get rid of it. But uh, prostate cancer often allows for a more extended process of evaluation. And uh, I have run into patients who extend the process interminably, they're afraid to make decisions, but there's some happy balance between those two extremes. You know, if you're not starting with a, a center that has a reputation for doing that treatment, that has a, a clear track record of having performed that particular procedure many, many times, that isn't specializing in doing that one procedure. In other words, they're doing it part-time, they're doing other things part-time. If you're not looking at those factors to start with as a basis, then you're, you're definitely looking in the wrong place. If uh, you're unwilling to travel to a different city to find a talented person, uh, then you're taking a chance. This is not a universal thing with medicine. Some things are fairly straight, gallbladder operations, appendectomies, 
prostate anatomy is incredibly complex and the stakes are so high because we, we have to urinate every day if we want to have any type of a future romantic life. The function of our uh, GI tract, can, which runs right behind the prostate, can be affected negatively. So these uh, mistakes are punished by you being reminded every time you go to the bathroom for the rest of your life, I made a mistake and now I'm living with this misery interminably. So that I say to motivate people to take their time and do the investigation to the best of their ability. There's no such perfect thing uh, in terms of finding a, you know, a godlike doctor that never makes mistakes. Doesn't exist. But there is an amazing range of quality to average to below average that diligent effort can elicit a fairly good understanding of what the quality is of the doctor you're, you're proposing to have treatment with. So I was reading in the comment section and one of the caregivers was pointing out that they found a center of excellence but they're on a wait list to be able to get treatment for, you know, a couple of months and they're concerned if it's higher grade cancer that waiting a couple months may be an issue. How does, you know, prostate cancer, it's a slower growing cancer but even in higher grade situations, is this a concern or do you think because she found that expert typically it's okay if they're monitoring? The simple answer is hopefully the experts have enough compassion for their patients uh, to realize that if the waiting list is becoming too long, that they'll uh, warn patients. Fortunately, I think that's rarely the case with prostate cancer. There are good studies showing that six-month delays for people with cancers that need treatment, these are the higher-grade cancers, that six-month delays don't make a difference in, in uh, long-term outcome. It's an emotional challenge. People, once they make their decision, they certainly want to move forward quickly. But you have to balance that out with uh, confidence uh, that you're in the hands of a, of a very talented person. Another question that came up multiple times is if you get radiation, do you have to get hormone therapy? Studies have shown with intermediate risk that four months of hormone therapy improves survival. And with high-risk prostate cancer, Gleason AIDS, PSA is over 20, that 18 months of hormone treatment improves survival when you give radiation. Studies are starting to come out showing that extended hormone treatment for high-risk disease in men that have surgery also improves survival, but those are so new and they're not widely realized yet. Adding hormone treatment is pre-PSMA PET scan data. The real advantage of hormone therapy, there's two advantages, but the, the big one, of course, is treating microscopic metastasis. Men that have clear PSMA PET scans are much less likely to have microscopic metastasis and therefore less likely to benefit by adding hormone treatment. But the studies to prove that are still pending. So this is a, a debatable area that we're in the interlude between the technology coming out and the studies proving a big benefit from the PSMA PET scan, which uh, alleviates the need for hormone therapy. There is certainly, going forward, going to be controversy about the need to add hormone therapy to reduce uh, the chance of future relapse due to the micrometastatic disease that was much more common before we had PSMA PET scans. But there's another factor as well, and that is the reality that uh, brachytherapy, seed implant radiation, is somewhat more potent than beam radiation. The beam radiation doctors are a little bit constrained by how their radiation hits the surrounding structures, and therefore they can't dial up the dose inside the prostate uh, the same way that a brachytherapist can. For that reason, to get confident eradication of the tumor in the prostate, especially with high-risk disease, four to six months of hormone therapy to enhance the radiation effect in the prostate may be beneficial. That is not the case with well-performed seed implants. Seed implants, the doses are adequate to sterilize the cancer consistently without hormone treatment. Is that widely understood in the industry? No. Uh, are the policies to uh, forego hormone treatment in these settings uh, incentivized by the existing uh, methodologies? No. But it is quite conceivable to do radiation treatment, particularly seed implant radiation treatment, without hormone therapy and expect very high cure rates inside the prostate. The next question is regarding urinary flow. So this person needs a TERP, but they're also scheduled for radiation, and they're wondering, can I get a TERP if I have radiation? Should I get it before? Should I get it after? And will, it, you know, will the TERP affect radiation's effectiveness if the cancer is near that area? TERP, definitely should be done before radiation. This is one of the, um, the downsides of radiation. When we talk about 
deciding what treatment to do. We compare the downside of one treatment with the downside of other treatments. And the downside of radiation is that your prostate will never be the same and the urethra going through the prostate will never be the same for the rest of your life. So men can be predisposed to a little bit of blood in their urine periodically. One big red flag is men who develop urinary outflow problems, which is a common accompaniment of prostate enlargement with age and just aging in general, would be when you hear the words, we better do a terp on your prostate to enhance your urinary flow. Men that have had previous radiation of the prostate do not heal as well as normal men who haven't had radiation. It is possible after embarking upon a procedure like this to get a non-healing wound in the prostate that can have lasting consequences. Such uh, procedures, if they're necessary, should be performed by super experts that are experienced in treating previously radiated patients. But to circumvent all that, men that have big prostates and a lot of pre-existing urinary problems should consider doing the TERP if that's what they're going to do. There's a lot of ways to treat big prostates, but we'll use the TERP as just a, as a uh, umbrella term for treating the prostate. That should be done prior to the radiation when the tissue's able to heal normally. Typically, as we've said already, men can postpone their prostate cancer treatment for up to six months, giving plenty of time for people to undergo whatever treatment their prostate needs to ensure good urine flow so that they don't have to face that type of treatment after radiation. Thank you to all of you who left questions and comments in our previous videos. When you ask a question, a lot of times multiple other people are dealing with it. And so when we get the opportunity to answer it with our medical teams, it's a really great way to get information that's helping a lot of people all at once. Also, thank you for being vulnerable and putting your stories out there. It's been awesome to see that other patients have been able to read other patients' stories, and I think they're equally as valuable educational experiences, just like our video. And so thank you so much for doing that. We appreciate you. And if you have more questions and more comments, please leave them in this section of the video comment section as well. And give us a thumbs up if this video was helpful for you. We want to hone in and try to help you as much as possible on this, your specific case. And even though we can't do case-specific questions in our comment section, we can do it through our helpline. And you can learn more about that at pcri.org forward slash helpline. These are prostate cancer patients who have not only dealt with treatments, but they know a lot about other treatments because of their education that they've been given by our medical oncology team and they're a great resource for you you know we want to make sure that when you're going into those doctor's appointments your quality of life is a priority that your mental health and emotional health is a priority and that you're getting your questions answered so please remember most of all you're not alone and i hope you have a great week